Welcome to Intangibles, a podcast about traits, behaviors, and qualities that entrepreneurs can cultivate to help them be successful. I'm your host, Steve Berg. I'm a partner at a New York City-based venture capital fund called Lytical Ventures. Season four is brought to you by Denton's Venture Technology Group at dentonsventurebeyond.com. Operating as a boutique within the world's largest law firm, the Venture Technology Group runs with hard-charging tech entrepreneurs to drive growth through strategic business, finance, and legal advice. From Silicon Valley and New York to London, Berlin, Hong Kong, and beyond. Learn more at dentonsventurebeyond.com. Also, please find Intangibles on the web at www.intangiblespodcast.com. I suspect there are a lot of people who, if browsing through a bookstore, came across a book with the title, Love Yourself Like Your Life Depends On It by Kamal Ravikant, might think, I'm not interested in new age self-help books. This is not for me. What those incredulous people would be missing is that they had come upon a book who folks like James Altshuler and Tim Ferriss think is essential reading. A book that has been one of the best-selling self-published books pretty much every year since it came out. And that Kamal Ravikant is not some huckster guru, but a startup founder and a venture investor has lived a pretty interesting life so far. Loving oneself is not your run-of-the-mill topic for this podcast, but it is an intangible quality to be sure. It is very important for startup founders, as we'll find out, and it can be learned. In general, any commentary of one's emotional state of mind is tough to get your hands around. That's why I'm so excited to introduce to you our guest today, Kamal Ravikant. Hello, Kamal. Welcome to Tangibles. Wow. What a great in- what a great intro. Thank you so much. Um, so I purposely left out uh-huh. a lot of interesting accomplishments <laughs> from your bio <laughs> because I, I wanted you to pick out the ones that you think are the more interesting or more important ones that kind of like reflect more on you. So sure. is there, what, what, if what, what did I leave? What should I have written if I was going to write? Well, this? I would think in my life the few the things that I'm proudest of is one I was a U.S. Army infantry soldier. And I went to college for a year at a full scholarship at a state school. And I was getting straight A's and just drinking and not going to class. I was bored. I was like, is this all this is? So I dropped out to the army. And as, also, well, as, well, as, as one, one does, do. as yeah. an 18 year old does. But yeah. also I wanted, you know, I was an immigrant child. We came to this country when I was a little kid. And I really felt like a strong sense of pride. I wanted to give back to this country and serve, uh, serve my country. And so I did that. I remember, and I, I was a... We're going to a uh, boot camp opening Georgia in summer. You know, the best time to be in Georgia is the summer. And infantry training there. And one of the biggest accomplishments of my life was uh, earning my infantry blue cord. When my drill sergeant put it, you know, at the end of boot camp, just clipped it on my shoulder. And I really felt for the first time in my life, I was a man, not a boy. I felt like I was crossing that threshold. I had been a boy for a long time, just to be clear. But I felt like I was crossing that threshold. I think I turned, yeah, I turned 19 in boot camp. And it was one of the proudest moments of my life that I look back even now. It's, um, there's very few people that don't register on one side of the scale of kind of EQ or kind of like, you know, process oriented kind of masculinity. You're one of the few people that I actually, I'm almost confused by because you, you <laughs> register so well on both sides of those spectrum. Yeah, you're not the only one who's confused. <laughs> <laughs> My um, mom still is, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a, good, it's a good puzzle to continue to have, I think. So um, LL Cool J might say, don't call it a comeback. But I think you're, if you read the book, there's literally you say, I staggered to my desk and made a vow. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That story... That's the start of a comeback. And I think yeah. that's a good way to start the discussion also. And, and it's why you wrote the book. Would you mind, it, I mean, I don't want to give away the whole book, no, obviously, sure. but would you mind retelling that particular sure, part of, of the story? Because I think it's, that's, you know, sets the table. Yeah, the last company I was building and uh, I was actually, ta- I wanted to clean up a space on the internet that's actually very, very, what I consider dirty and shady and made possible by Google and Yahoo, which made them several billion a year. And one thing I learned in my career was you don't, change industries by telling people to change. You change it by make it more profitable for the the alternative more profitable for them. Yeah. So I created a company in the space where I actually started taking away Google and Yahoo big customers of theirs. And in the process, I um and I got I was I mean this was close to pulling off. I put all my money in. Once I started running out of money, I brought in some venture friends, you know, and family as well. And 
you know, I kind of went, uh, kind of got a little seduced by the money. And we were, we just, uh, we blew up. Our company completely blew up. I lost everything. I, I had to look people in the eye who were friends and family and say, I lost your money. Like each one, I went to them, looked them in the eye and said, I'm sorry. Uh, it was horrible. And at the same time, I got very, very sick. I just, basically, I'd been going for over almost four years as a founder, no vacations. Like anyone listening to this, you listening, to, you know, you sitting across from me can understand this. Like just going all in, nothing. My life was obsessed. I was going to pull this company off and make a bunch of money and have done something big and blah, blah, blah. And it all became meant to zero. And I was just sick and depressed. I couldn't get out of bed. And, uh, and I was, so, I, I mean, in all honesty, I was very suicidal. Um, the only thing, I think the only reason I didn't, I was living in San Francisco at the time and I could, at my window, I could see the Bay Bridge. From, and the only thing that kept me from walking there and jumping off was the fact that I was too sick to walk there, <laughs> was to walk. And this is before Uber started, so I couldn't have taken an Uber. And cabs <laughs> never came in my area. So, <laughs> like, so. I mean, it's a huge state. I mean, pride and ego, right? The, you, you, you had ev- you had pride, you had everything yeah. here. And, and, and you know what, what, what the... Lesson there is, you know, I thought I was a failure and that was the worst thing I could be. Whereas if you look back, who's a failure? A failure is someone who doesn't try. I gave it everything. Most most uh, ventures don't succeed. We know that, right, in this business. Yet my ego, my sense of identity got caught up in it so much that if it collapsed, there was no identity. My identity collapsed and the only identity I had left was I was a failure. I'd failed everyone. I was an outcast, blah, blah, you know, name the throw in the words I was there and I remember one night I was just miserable and desperate I thought like I can't do this anymore I mean again literally crawl over the Bay Bridge and end this or I'm gonna do something get out I'm gonna get out of this or die trying and for some reason I literally got up and sta- like half staggered to my desk where I kept a journal and in my journal I took this pen and I wrote down a vow to myself and I'm a huge believer in the transformative power of commitment. You know, like if you commit, you're in. There's no, I'm going to try, maybe that's it. You're in. Like it's done, right? And what came out of me was a vow to love myself. And it was a very deep and powerful vow. And it was almost like, I think I just carved right through the paper. And I then I sat back and looked at it. What the hell did I just do? Because like, how does one go? It was a vow to love myself. It came from a place of desperation, which is kind of interesting that... The human self, where it really goes, love, you know, to save itself, it goes to love. You know, there's so much literature and movies and so forth that show that same thing. And yet to realize that, that my, to save myself, I went to love and love for myself. That some part of me realized that that, that was how I need to save myself. And so now here I am, sick, locked up in my apartment. My company's like in the throes of finally like fully falling apart. Uh, my team's revolting and some investors are revolting, you know, all the fun stuff you can throw at it. I, and all it was just, I started working myself because I'd made a commitment, but I had no idea how to do it. So I started doing, my first career was in clinical research and trauma research. So I used to work in the ER level one trauma centers. And I've watched maybe, maybe over a thousand people die in front of me, all trauma cases, bad trauma cases. And so I, but I used to do clinical trials. So I started running clinical trials in my head I just started like, the only thing I could control was my head. That was it. Life was falling apart. The only control I had was my head. My body was falling apart. The only control I had my head. So I just started working on my head and I started doing things. And if I noticed it caused any kind of shift, I went deeper. If they didn't, I just threw them away. I was zero attachment. It was like purely like no attachment. All I wanted was results. That was like the startup guy in me coming out. Like all I want is results. And I just went deeper and deeper and deeper. And I came up with some sort of a system that started doing regularly. And you know what? My mind shifted. Like, and it was an obsessive level. I'll tell you. Like, I was like all in. I was literally doing this. I'm gonna, I'm, or I'm out. And and my mind started to shift, and my body started to get better, and things just got a bit faster. And then the here's the weirdest part that I did not expect. So you can say, okay, placebo effect and all that stuff. The mind over matter, it does work. You know, mind over body, it does work. But then life started to work. Like, think that's the only way I can put it. Like, like all these random serendipitous coincidences started happening that never, ever, ever in a million years could I fathom. And all I did was continue this process of loving myself. And I started to realize the more I did it, the more these happened. And the more I, I just started thinking of life as becoming magical. They talk about within within a month, a guy who was miserable, 
the only word he could describe himself was a failure. You know, that was a polite word I was giving myself. They were way more, less, you know, way less polite word to like someone who's walking around like loving life and feeling like it's all magic, you know, within a month. And the company still shut down, which was part of the process. It was done. It was time for me to leave. I, it was, um, and, but from that, you know, I was able to go on and build like, build, build from, I actually had to start from scratch, below scratch. I was in severe credit card debt. You know, like I was actually like paying off everything, credit cards at one point. And, and so I had to start from below scratch. And at that point in my career, it was like, it was a hell of a blow to the ego, but it was almost like, wow, I start fresh. What now? You so know. first of all, leave it to an entrepreneur to obsessively <laughs> A-B test on oneself, right? <laughs> so like, you almost were like the quintessential Petri dish for this. <laughs> so, but leaving that aside, the exact vow mm-hmm. was this, this day... I vow to myself to love myself, to treat myself as someone I truly love and deeply in my thoughts, in my actions, the choices I make, the experiences I have, each moment I'm conscious, I will make the decision, I will love myself. Let's talk about this vow. The language is very, very important. People go through their whole lives sometimes without even making a vow, period. Mm. But the specific words that you use Let's just talk about, first of all, the significance of making a vow versus yeah. just deciding to do it, yeah. right? That, I think you hinted, you, you kind of alluded to the fact that, you know, you didn't tell other people at the moment, but, that, told was, no one. but that was your way. That was my stake. That was your on, line in the sand. That was my stake on this planet. That's it. This is my stake and I'm either, I'm hanging on to it, come hell out of water. Yeah. Um, I really do believe that to create anything great in life, whether it's in ourselves or outside or relationships or in companies, it requires like a full on commitment. Right. That's it. I don't believe in um, middle ground there. Right. Um, you know, we can we can go to the middle ground once we've actually achieved what our commitment got us there. Right. But we can't get there right. uh, without it. Yeah. And so the conscious decision was a result of hitting rock bottom or is, is that just something that's in your makeup, right? Like that you, you, that you say I am uh, prone to action, right? That you're, you're, you're always going to, you're always going to do something aggressive, progressive. And you realize that you, you were, you were no longer doing that. And that is what the, the moment was where you're like, I need to be, my character says that I'm, I'm, I'm prone towards action. Actually, and that's a great question, by the way. Uh, you made me think there. Actually, you know, honestly, I think I'm like the laziest person on the planet. And this was more, and in spite of that, I think I get I get an insane amount done because of I, ma- I make commitments. And I've learned along the way just, you know, it's like anything. It's like when you learn to exercise and you start to see the results, something in your ships, you can never lie to yourself about exercise ever again. You die, you start to see the results. Same thing, if you start making commitments in your life and you start to see the results, then you know what works. You know, I don't think I was ever someone who was, I was never taught that. You know, there was no sit down, talk in a family about commitments or vows or whatever. I come from a broken family, you know, single mom, raised my brother and I. Um, it's just, I, I think something I've seen through life and I just started to apply it. And here it was pure out of desperation, but I also realized a vow to oneself is a sacred act. No matter what you believe okay. to oneself, that is sacred. Right. Even if we just, we're just nothing but molecules and atoms that just disperse, but the, to oneself. The moment that you can no, no longer lie to yourself. The vow to oneself is the ultimate sacred act. So this is a really hard question. Because I'm not even sure if you you really know this, but what changes mentally at that moment? Like what what's going on in your head? Is it is it I can't go back? Is it I've committed fully? Is it you more think, than is it more than that? Is you it think like forward? You think how do I now? Now you don't think of what what you left behind. You think how do I do this? Your yeah. mind starts working and asking different questions. Yeah. And when you do that, you start getting different answers and your answers are, those are your thoughts. Um, I think that's the thing. Um, you know, you can always slide back. You know, I, I do it every single yeah, day. You talk about that. Right. But you also learn the power of like, like, look, I'm human. You get up, you dust yourself off, you move forward. 
and it's like three steps forward, one step back, three steps forward, two steps back. But the progress, the the delta is always forward. Yeah. So I think what changes here is that it's not that you look behind where you were. You're no longer looking behind or what to do. You're actually asking, okay, how do I do this? Mm -hmm. When you say, how do I do this? Your brain starts searching for things. It starts looking for answers. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, propulsive movement forward. Yeah, um, and but what and what about physically? I mean, obviously you you got better, mm -hmm. but did it like did you nearly like feel a weight off your shoulders almost instantly? No, or did you? No, it took. It, it, but there's one thing in making vows. You got the work's living it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The yeah. vows like yeah. you, the line on the stand, but now like get up and do the work. You know that's what that's what uh, I think life is like. No matter what what grand things that we come up with or the plans or insights or whatever, you know, I'm full of them, but the work is not coming up with them. The work is actually the day-to-day -day living them as a human being, as a flawed, you know, human and a flawed species and a flawed whatever, you know, the yeah. uh, living that. Right. That's the work. Yeah. And so the, phys so the physical part is, you know, kind of a long road. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, and, you know, then, then it depends how obsessive you, you become about it. Right. I was kind of like all in at the time. I had nothing else to do. And, and so I was pretty obsessive. So I think it worked really fast for me. That's why. Mm -hmm. So the more you give it, the more you get. One other question about that moment. Why was it up, that up until that moment, moment, it was easier for you to love others than it was for you to love yourself? Oh man, that's the that's the human question, isn't it? Um, it's easier to love others because we've seen others more. What I think maybe what we want for ourselves, or maybe it's almost. I think some of it comes out of fear. A lot of what we call love for others is actually fear based. You know, we want them to be a certain way, we need them to be a certain way, and we love them that way. Because, um, you know, I. Um, I think that's part of it. But that was the case. I mean, I, I, you, you, at, that, at, at that moment, you were more concerned about your investors. You were more concerned about your oh, family. Oh, that's a great you point. You're right. I didn't right. think of that. You, you were up till then, up until that moment, prioritizing others. Right? In every way. And actually, here's the interesting irony. I think true narcissism, uh, like, like if we, narcissism is prioritizing ourselves in a negative way. Because look, I was prioritizing myself in a negative way. I was feeling horrible about myself in relation to everybody else. Right, because it wasn't meeting up to your own expectations. It wasn't good enough. It yeah. would never be good enough. Yeah, I, you know, someone actually asked me, isn't loving yourself narcissistic? I think, no, hating yourself is narcissistic. If you love yourself, you start becoming a pretty damn good human to be around. And that's not narcissistic. That's actually a good thing to be, you know? <laughs> It's, it's an it's a interesting twist in logic, right? I mean, it's just the unexpected. Yeah. And, you know, once you say it out loud, you're, well, well, yes, of course, that makes perfect sense. But up until you do that, um, it doesn't seem like it, it does. Um, okay. Um, so you make a vow to love yourself. Um, why don't you just go buy a Maserati? Uh, why I was broke. <laughs> I had no money. <laughs> I was sick. <laughs> you, you, you chose a mantra, Right. Um, well, first of all, I, maybe I should even step back. Did you think of that as a mantra? No, no, no. You I didn't. Would. Like, well, I, maybe that's probably a good time to tell the rest of the story. Like, this became you, you're you're not kidding about kind of the obsession yeah. and the aggression with which you pursued this kind of new vow. This because what I re realized was the only thing I could work on was on my inside. My outside was falling apart, and ultimately in life, that is the only control we have. Right. If you think think right. about it. Right. Right. It's, you know, there's a classic, it's not what happens to you, it's how you react to it, blah, blah, blah. We all know that. But I think, but I've come to believe it's not even that because that's still reactive. I think we can be proactive in our life by starting by choosing our thoughts consciously. And when we do that, life starts from there, right? Versus reacting to external, yep. how everyone is, is around us, right. and then reacting to that. We can be either proactive in life or reactive. And I think to be truly proactive, you start with controlling your own mind. And I don't mean controlling it as in a, I'm going to become a Zen Buddhist and it's going right. to be just a one flame flickering in there. More like, who do I want to be? What do I want in there? What do I want coming out of me? Um, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little carried away. If you want to repeat that question. Uh, no, I mean, I think, I think that it is a little bit about you selling it to yourself, right? You have this idea and you're not entirely sure just about how to go about it. Yeah. And you kind yeah. of have to like... Self-talk, like convince yourself, Literally, work would, yourself up and like, you have to sell yourself on, hell yes, I can do this. Yeah. Yeah. And I just basically was trying to figure out the, the only thing I could do was literally talk to myself in, in my head, which we all do anyway. 
So right. I started kind of started focusing on what am I talking to in my head and started like distilling it down to one core thing. And I was like, well, I made a vow to love myself. I wanted to try telling myself I love myself. <laughs> right. You know, so I started doing that obsessively and I actually started to work. And then more came out of that. Like there are other things I started doing that actually added to it. But that was basically like the first thing I could do that I had full control yeah. over that we'll always have control over, no right. matter what in life. And the other thing about it is that you put this in writing. Right. So there's now evidence. And evidence of my commitment to myself. We had one podcast guest come on and said that he put his goals on the bathroom mirror for himself yeah. to see it. And that's yeah. a, it's, a, it's almost like a similar thing. Um, did it? When did it get to the point where you felt like, oh, I need to tell others now, right? I mean, at first you didn't, but yeah, at some yeah. point you had to like, you wanted to. Once I was better, I was talking to a, a, co a old co-founder of mine. He was, he was from that same company. He'd burned out six months in. We were working so hard. I was the only one who started from scratch and stayed all the way through. Everyone else had just burned out along the way. Right. <laughs> <You know>? Corpses, <laughs> shells of people. You know, it's classic founder stuff. No one cares. As much as great people are, no one puts it as much as you do. That's, And one should not complain that. A complaint about, about being a founder because that is required to be a founder. Don't do it otherwise. You know, it's like yep. people complain about leadership. Well, don't do it. <laughs> it's part of leadership. It's right. lonely, right? right? And so I was talking to him and he was going through a hard time. I was like, no, no, no dude, don't, I figured it out. I figured it out. Like, uh, here, here's all you need to do is I quickly wrote up a little thing and sent it to him. And he kind of pl he applied it and it, it helped him. So there were some other friends and then going through stuff. So I would just like send them little write-ups here and there and it worked for them. And so I was like, okay. And I didn't set out to write a book about it. Actually, I actually have fought that. What a lot of people don't knew, know is while I was building startups in the Valley since the 90s, I was also obsessively teaching myself to be a writer. I was writing novels and I was obsessively studying Hemingway and the greats. The people were out at night partying. I was reading, you know, For Whom the Bell Tolls, underlying for the 15th time, see how I made a comma turn, you know, just just working on it and collecting rejection letters along the way. Yeah. And they, you know, they started with like- You had it coming from all sides, man. <laughs> <laughs> and and so, but it got to the point the rejection letters were all like personal meetings and so forth, but they were like, look, you're an unknown novelist. Like they don't publish those. So I put the whole writing thing aside. I was just all in on tech. And then I did this as a, actually James Altucher, you know, offered to write as a guest boss on his yeah, blog. Yeah. And, and I said, well, tell you what, let me let me write it. And and he said, tell you what, if you write it as a, like a little book, uh, you know, he said it's something like write as a little book. First, he wanted to write his blog. And I said, no, I was terrified. His blog was like the one thing we all read at the time. And I was terrified of like all my peers seeing like, what this guy, you know, fell apart. He's loving himself. What right. the hell, right? <laughs> New agey, <laughs> yeah, yeah, cheesy, it's... yeah. Uh, and you know, especially living in California, uh, par for the course, right? And um, so I wrote this, but when I sat down to write this book, I was like, okay, now if, if I'm gonna give this to someone, I have to write as real and true as I can and take my ego out of it. So I locked myself in for like quite a while and worked on this obsessively, and I I cut out, I, I hacked with it, edited with an axe, I cut out like over ninety percent of what I wrote. And wrote and rewrote, rewrote. And what was left was something simple and just what I wish, something simple and true and effective. That's something that I wish someone had given me when I was down. Like, look, dude, here it is. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And that's what I put out to the world. I hate to tell you this, but the first thing you did was A-B test it. The second thing you did was share it with your co-founder, product market fit. <laughs> then the third thing you did was like, you know, jam the pipe with it, you uh -huh. know, finding a, um, a, a somebody to, to lend you credibility um, to, bring it to, the, to bring it to the market. <laughs> Sorry, man. No, I love it. <laughs> a little, little, like, little, little VC analysis the, there. The hindsight story is great. Um, so there's, you mentioned um, James Altschiller. There's a significant discussion in the book about vulnerability. Um, and there's an ultra quote, uh, which you seem to agree with. It says, I don't do a post unless I wonder what people think of me. In addition, one time, um, you mentioned people are really going to think I'm weird for sharing this, yeah. right? We were just yeah. kind of touching on that. Um, what's the value of going out on a limb? Um, is it about gaining conviction or exhibiting vulnerability that actually has value to the process and gaining self-confidence and self-trust? Why? Why is it that you feel that, you know, as you thought this through, I need to be vulnerable and I need to go out on a limb here? I never thought of the word vulnerable, honestly. I was, 
I try to stay away from words like vulnerable, integrity, and so forth. It's so overused, right? It's like if I see one more hashtag like that, I'm going to vomit. Um, what I was, I was trying to be, and I'm really grateful that Hemingway was the one I studied because he was, it was like, you have to tell that it's true, clear writing. And all I had to do here was tell the truth in the clearest, simplest manner possible, mm. you know? And, and so that's, that's what I did. And the thing about putting yourself out there, um, I was terrified. I almost didn't publish this book. Very, very close. If it wasn't for the commitment, it was also, I made a commitment to James I Wood if he liked it and he right. liked it. Right? right. So another commitment I had to keep. Um, but I was at that point, I was like starting to believe in the power of commitment. Like commitment kind of was working out, you know, like you don't know what's going to happen. You got to do it. And on the other side is magic. Um, and so I don't think it's a matter of just making yourself look like fools are vulnerable for the sake of it. You got to have something you believe in. Right. And if you're afraid what people are going to think of you because of what you believe in, that's when you do it. Not for the sake of, oh, let me go be vulnerable. It's got to be something you, you will really stand up for. And this, yep. I would have stood up for in front of anyone and swore up and down that this is the secret. This, this, this is, is it. You found the secret. Yeah. Yeah. I remember yeah. that story about you being at a... Um, a conference and yeah, and I was like, follow I follow someone, and then you're like, I, I just figured it out, and they all laughed, and then you told, then you then you told them the story that you just told me, and they were like, yeah, literally, I was in, in front of like all these like uh, Washington like senators and Congress people and CEOs and like old fuddy duddies, and and here I am talking about like I'm like I figured out the secret of life, and here it is. When I said I figured out the secret of life, it was like the audience laughed. Yeah, and I said, and here it is, and I had two minutes to tell it. By the end of two minutes, quiet. And a lot, then when I got off, there was like a line of people wanting to talk yeah. to me, which I did not expect. I thought, time to slink away, like go back to the <laughs> hotel room, pretend this never happened. And it was the opposite. It was the opposite. Um, so we just talked about um, vulnerability being a, uh, kind of a, you know, less than good word. I think I it's overused yeah, in context. Yeah. It's like... I find uh, authenticity another one of those words. All those words. Any ease. Um, anything. Integrity. Whatever. <laughs> it's not going to stop me from asking a question about authenticity. Uh-huh. Um, the expression, share your truth. Yeah. It, it gets used a number of times in this book. Um, I want to explore just a little bit. Um, despite authenticity being a less than valuable word at the moment... Does this does the expression "share your truth" have to do with authenticity in your mind, or um, you share if you're sharing what your truth is? That is being authentic, right? It could be anything. Look, if you whatever you sincerely is the thing that's changed you. What's your true true thing? What's your thing? Yeah, that is being what is that is the fundamental of being authentic. You don't have to use that word. Okay, then this is the real hard question, and I'm go for you it. You don't have to have you have great you have great so questions. How? How does the individual, how do I, how does some other founder out there, some other anybody, how does that individual define his or her own truth? I mean, you took a long time to boil it down, right? What did, what did you do? Well, how you know, do, that wasn't my, you mean, that wasn't my truth before. It could have been something else. You know, it could have been uh, bettering myself. I mean, be, you know, we are we evolve as human beings, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it could have been, uh, my truth could have been probably more like building things and sharing great things with the world that cha- that make make people's lives better. It could have been anything. Whatever your th- our thing is, we all have our own thing, you know? I just think it's really hard to get to that thing. I, th- I think it involves, if we sit around and watch TV, if we sit around and mindlessly, if we mindlessly consume, we won't have it. It require it's hard because it requires self-inquiry. Yeah. And self-inquiry is. is not easy. It requires going away from the predictable. It, go, it requires going away from the books that walk you through a process. It requires just you being with yourself and knowing who you are and what you stand for. Yeah, it's the mental heavy lifting. And yeah. I, I think, I think one, people don't necessarily know how to do it. And two, they don't even know to do it, right? And I think, you know, that's probably, probably some of the value in the message is kind of waking people up to like, hey, I got to spend some time thinking about this, right? I got to some, t- some, you know, this guy figured it out for himself. I need to figure it out for myself. And just, you know, having an example, I think is, you know, hugely powerful. You know, I had a follow-up book to this that I self-published called Live Your Truth. And, um, you know, a lot of people consider it a better book, but one of the criticisms I got was there was no step-by-step process on figuring out the truth because it's like anyone who tells you they have that is selling you snake oil. Mm-hmm. There's no step-by-step process of figuring yeah. out your truth. Yeah. All I can do is guide you through the thinking that's involved to get 
to start asking yourself the right things and to almost like change your mindset to get there. That's the best I can do. You All you can do is like point at the moon. Right. You can't say I got the moon for you. Right. Right. And then even in, um, oh, I'd love to talk about my, my novel when, somewhere along for the sure. way. Yeah, for sure. No, but now uh, last year Hachette published it called yes. Rebirth. Yes, which yes, yes. I worked incredibly hard on it. It's a really special book. And that actually ties in all these concepts in a story. Right. You know, because th- what I've come to believe is in the end, it's like, do you have kids? I have a little boy. You have a little boy. Do you read him bullet points at bed at bedtime? Or do you read him uh, stories? No, but you know what? He's just addicted to graphic novels, which I, which are, which are the equivalent of bullet points, yeah. and I hate it. Like we're like, <laughs> well, they're not actually. They're, he, they're, he's, he speaks that way. Almost. He speaks in bullet points. That's <laughs> funny. But that is storytelling, and I realize a way to like weave in lessons if, uh, to a reader is actually tell them in a story and repeat it throughout in different ways to different characters and sure. arcs that by the time you're done, it's like woven into you. Right. Um, uh, this writing is is uh, is a great way, you know. Like anyway, like you know, we live in such an amazing time. Like the the gatekeepers, you know. Like to, even to do this, right. I was watching Joe Rogan uh, yesterday interview uh, Rhonda Patrick. I'm a huge fan. We're, we're uh, Rhonda Patrick fans around here, right? Well. Yeah. I mean, like it was a four hour podcast. Where do you get that kind of long form interviews that is so deep and so nuanced? You don't get, if, with traditional media, you would never get that. You would have, what, what was the longest? Charlie Rose used to have an hour show. Yeah. But even that was like, you had to be A plus level to get on there. Right. You know, and it was, it still didn't go that deep. And I'll tell you what, Rhonda Patrick is probably one of the few people that can talk in depth oh my with God. authority oh my God. Um, for, yeah. that, for that long time and not run out of materials. And, He's got so much. And so that's like at this day where if you have a voice, you the you can get it out there in so many yeah. ways if you really want to get it out there. Yeah. That's your thing. Yeah. Um, that is part of I think the modern day sharing your truth. If you have something, share it. It changes people's lives. Yeah. Cha- and in changing people's lives, here's what I've learned. I put this book out there. I gave a lot to it. I took a big risk in my career. Yeah. Fair enough. But what this book's given back to me is ungodly amount. I mean, godly amount actually is a better word than I could ever have imagined. It, this book has changed changed my life putting and changed so many lives. I get emails every day from yeah. people. You it know, created a, a, r- a ripple in the pond that is rippling into time. Yeah, and, and that ripple comes back to like make you better. Yeah. There is there is a magic to sharing your truth. So, you know, self-love, I keep thinking about this self-love. Is, is this self-confidence and self-assuredness or is that a subset of what the book is about? Or I think self-confidence, self-assuredness arises from there. I went for what is the most primal thing I could go for. Yeah. You know, everything yeah. else is, if it's not primal, you're still, uh, you're not getting to the root cause. And if you go to the root cause, everything else arises from there. So every time I've, I look back and I've had issues in my life since then, I've been failing there at the root cause. You, you've, you've ah, which is a perfect, this is a great segue. You talk about this as a practice in oh, the book. Yeah. You talk about yeah. it as a practice. Um, why, why does it need to be a practice? Uh, because our brains are too wired to, you know, over a lifetime to think a certain way. And if you, if you, since my first career was trauma research and I studied biology, I had a degree in biology and economics and, and you know, neuroplasticity, like our brains are wired, like we basically laid down these pathways and we kind of wired to lay down pathways that are fear-based, that are and that response to the environment for our survival. Modern day, they go, they're flickering on every other second when they really shouldn't be. And we basically have these. We think we're thinking thoughts, but most of the time, thoughts are just the same random thread. Yeah. May, you know, of anger, you may throw someone else in there, pull someone else out. It's the same thread. So my thesis was was I'm going to create a new focus thread mm-hmm. and make that the thread. And yeah. and I found that it works. And but to do that. It's like anything. It's like working out. It's like eating healthy, whatever. You got to make it a practice because eventually if you don't, the body reverts to what it was trained for over a lifetime. By the way, I think that's why it was a mantra at the beginning, right? Because you were laying down new pathways. Yes. And I still do it. Yeah. I still do it. And you know, the more obsessively I do it, the better life gets, the better I get. Yeah. I think it might be a good time to talk about light switches. Mm -hmm. You want to spend a little time explaining what light switches are? I'm trying to remember that chapter... uh, 
It's been a while since I read it. Um, since you read your own book? Well, actually, you know what? So, I'm actually working on an expanded version of it right now. I just finished the third draft oh, the other day. Oh, okay. So I'll give you I'll give you a little bit of help. The Richard Bandler one? <laughs> so the, you're talking spe- you're talking specifically about the vigilance to remain in light or love and that for time to time it will you know things will darken if you're Oh yeah, if, yeah, yeah, light switches, the yeah. of light switches. Yeah, it's it's a it was a metaphor that um who did it come from? James Basically, it's a metaphor for like, look, we are human. We are fallible. We know we're going to go through life, but things are going to happen. We, we're not going to revert to our best self. All of us right. revert to off, more than not our worst self than our best self. So have certain things that we've set aside that we know that when we get there, do why? If, right. if I start to feel a certain way, do why? It switches me out. And it sounds easy. It's actually and too easy, right? But the problem is, it's like anything, you got to make it a habit. You right. got to make it a consistent practice. So a light switch could be anytime you start to feel a certain way, you switch to loving, loving yourself, right. right? You do it over time. Eventually what happens is you, you create the pathway where that starts to happen more on its own. Yeah. Which you start to realize, wow, that's beautiful. Like you're having stimulus, response, stimulus, response, and the response is different. Yeah. You know, and then from there... Um, it's always better to be implicit in loving yourself no matter what you're going through in life. For sure. Um, especially when you, it's, and it's not, it's not like, um, and I don't mean self-esteem because self-esteem can be f- um, certain, I've found some self-esteem to be fear-based. I'm talking about like a true, deep, authentic, right. pure, primal love for yourself. If right. you're in that place, I have, that's when goodness comes. So did your mind actually try to stop you from convincing yourself all the time that in fact you do love yourself is it like actively working yeah, against yeah, yeah. you convincing it's, yourself? it's funny the mind's a mind's a monkey you know it really is a monkey and it's it's powerful you know maybe you can look at it as the ego as as like this whole structure that's been built over my life to think a certain way if you start to force something else on it it rebels and that's where a commitment comes in right you know it's like same thing with like working enough you never worked on your life and you go to the gym and it, you go to first day and it's embarrassing and it's hard and you come by your, and you, you just don't feel very good. You know, it's easier for you to convince yourself, oh, that's not for me. Or go for five days, or, right. or, but you haven't changed your diet. You don't get help. Convince yourself, oh, I tried, didn't work. That's where commitment comes in. If you made a commitment, you'll stick with it. You'll see the results. Right. Right. So, okay. There's a quote in the book, if you love yourself, life loves you back. Yeah. So, you're saying that for whatever reason, you get to that point where you've kind of mentally and emotionally changed a little bit and the world just opens up to you? It does. That I never could have predicted. Yeah. I hear a lot of people reach out to me with theories about it. Honestly, they're all theories. I don't know what the reason is. I just yeah. know, I've just kind of come to accept that that's how life works. Yeah. It starts from the inside. Do you think it's related to like stoicism or essentialism in no, any way? No, not no. really. Because this is this is not stoicism. Right. And stoicism is still like, you know, off, you think of the worst case scenario and so forth. And stoicism is more mind-based. Yeah. This is more primal-based. Okay. Because we're pri- this is primal conditioning. Right. Like, you know, I use this line in the book and I was quite enjoyed it when I wrote it. If you've ever been a baby, you've known love. Like, so it, you're wired for it. We're wired for love and fear. All the other things, you know, are conditioned over a lifetime, but they're based on those two foundations. Right. So, like, it's like, don't want to work on fear, don't want to work on love. If rather not like, if rather you could say, I don't, I want to work on not fear. I don't know. Just work on love and like, take right. care of that. Right. I don't know if you want to touch on this or not. Please um, go for it. There's a part of the book where you break down the practice into three parts. Mm-hmm. Uh, one, mental loop. Two, meditation. Three, uh, one question. Mm-hmm. Um is it you think it's worth spending time on or is it just I think I go into more detail in the book. The yeah. reason being because I've laid down a step by step process that simplifies it and anyone can that's you know, a lot of people have reached out to me and said, Because you did it that way, I was able to do it. Right. Um rather than just give the whole bullet points on it. Okay. Um, yeah, I was asking you earlier about how long it took, and now I remember that there's actually a place where you mentioned that it took you about a month. Um, do you, do you, when it was happening during that month's time, did you notice any stages of like changes of like stages? No, no, I think it's almost logarithmic. Oh, oh, I don't don't think it's like linear. I think it's logarithmic. You go in, you go in jumps. Cool. Cool. 
Um, but the key is consistency, and that's hard. That, that, that is, and, and back to the practice, right? I mean, we, we probably didn't spend enough time in discussion of the notion that you, I mean, you're really kind of committed to practice, and you even had you know, a moment where you're like, hey, no, I got this licked, I'm good. <laughs> and I got lazy. <laughs> and then you, know, you got kicked back under your butt again. And you know what? I've gotten lazy moderately. many times in life, and I'm the one who wrote the book. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know? And each yeah, time I yeah, come back yeah, to my yeah. own book, but, you know, it's, but I've learned actually certain things over time that I've, I've, since I wrote the book that are, that allow me to keep that consistency, make it simpler, more efficient. Yeah. Being the startup guy that I Yes. Am. And so that's kind of what I'm working on right now as a book is I'm, I'm not a separate book. I'm just adding it to this book. You're lowering the barrier to acceptance. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Here's the VC. Keep going, keep going, keep going, man. I got more, I got money, I got many more. Um, during World War II, um, a general named Vinegar Joe. Uh, Vinegar Vin- Joe. Vinegar Joe Stillwell. He popularized um, Stillwell. a Latin expression, um, and that was nil carbondrum illegitimi, which it loosely translated means don't let the bastards grind you down. Um, in was, this world- was he in, was he in the European? He must have been in the European theater. He was, in fact. And he was, he was a, um, a successful guy, and he actually had some of his troops walking around uttering this like phrase in Latin. It's a great phrase. Yeah. Don't let the bastard grind you down. Um, so my question is, you know, we're in a world right now that's essentially designed to distract us from practices like what we're describing here, what you're telling about, uh, uh, telling yeah. us to do. How do we stop like Neil Carbodium illegitimi? How do we stop the bastard from grinding us down? Well, not only is the world designed, our brain is designed not to do that. A brain's in, the brain is designed not, not to have one single focused thought. You know, it, a brain is done just to jump around. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it literally, sometimes I, I look at my mind like, what is this crazy monkey doing? You know? And so we got that. And then we got this world out there with all this. And literally, it takes a level of discipline, which I believe comes from commitment. Right. So, you know, when people ask, like, how can you be disciplined? Simple, make a commitment. That will lead to the discipline to do what you want it, and, and fully understand what the power of that commitment means to you, what the word commitment means to you. Come to terms with that. Come to terms with what you're willing to do for a commitment. And when you're there, right, this ain't half-assing. This, this ain't, I think I'll do it. You've got to bring it. This is like, I'm in, yeah. right? There is no, you know, the Cortez burned the ships? Not even that. There's like the ships never existed. And th- that's done. I'm here. When you do that, you figure out what, you, what you're what you willing to do and what you're not to do. And also realize we're human. We're going to fail every day. But like learn from it, adapt, you know? So, you know, I've done, I've gone through phases where I've removed every social media app from my phone. And I bet you, and I'll tell you what, my mind is better for it. I'm happier, naturally happier. But then eventually I put them back on because, you know, we need to be involved in social media if you're, you know, quote unquote need to be. I think it revolves, involves a level of discipline. What I do concern, what I am curious about is the next generation, like how they're going to be. The n- I bet you they're going to they're gonna be smart about it because they're growing up with it. So I have faith in them. Hopefully you're right. Right. But yeah, I mean, the people that are native. Yeah. Right? Application we're not native. native. We're not. No, we're, we're not. not. Which is why we have problems with it. If you're application native, eventually, you know, the mind is so adaptable, so pliable. I, I have faith in them to figure this out better than we ever did. I want to learn from them. Hopefully. It right? seems like we're still on that line of absorption that where it's still going for pretty crazy. I do think that one thing we have to do is we have to stop outrage. Anytime we get outraged, I get outraged every day reading politics stuff, you know? Yeah. And I have to like take a break from it and say, okay, what can I do about it? You know, okay, I'm, I'm in a place in my life I'm not the guy to go march on Washington for anything, but look, I can fund groups. I can give money to things. I can fund individuals. We can all do something. Outrage on social media is the worst form of participation because you feel like you did something and instead you did nothing and made yourself feel bad. In fact, I think it actually leads to entrenchment, yeah. which is counterproductive. And it's the worst because you actually feel like you're taking action when it is the ultimate inaction. Yep. So I think with this, sorry, um, I think with this, uh, going back to the world that's designed, a brain that's designed, it literally comes down to committing. Discipline comes from that. And then just doing it, practice, and see what gets in the way. It's like, you know, I love using the example of, of fitness as a, going to the gym every day. What gets in the way? You know, you, you move your schedule around it if you're committed to that, right? Same thing here. Commit to loving yourself. It'll change your life. Dead mine. Yeah. So before we started recording today, um, just out in the hallway of the office here, we were talking about the kind of contrasting 
things that one needs to be to be successful, right? Tough, tough-minded and open-minded. Um, you are both a founder and an investor, right? So what is your opinion on how we reconcile the aggression, the toughness, the inevitable distraction that goes along with being a founder with the message of the book, which is, you know, to be, you know, not so hard on yourself, to be kind of more, not placid isn't the right word per se, but to kind of like be calmer, cooler, more in tune, more empathetic. How, how do we reconcile that stuff? Well, actually, I've never said that. And that's very interesting, right? I've become that way, but that's just my experience. Yeah. I think, like, for example, if I really loved myself, I wouldn't have put up with certain partners in okay. that company. Right. I wouldn't have put up with certain uh, behavior, certain employees, or certain uh, certain things that happen. I would just be like, no. And you right. know what? It would save me a year, year of misery. I probably would have made the company work, honestly. Right. You know, you, you just... You, when you love yourself, you tolerate less. And I think you, uh, you, know, you tolerate less that doesn't serve you or you're the grand thing. Mm. And that's actually a good thing, you know? Yeah, so what you're saying is you're, you would have aligned yourself yeah. differently. With more, yeah. more, like-minded isn't exactly right, but you know, people that were kind of on the level that you yeah. were intending to be and you were working toward. Yeah, because where made you, a difference. Otherwise, I think a lot of founders, including myself, or you know, fear-based, like I got to do this, otherwise this won't work. Yeah, that if you come in from that way, it's always, you know, odds are it won't work anyway. <laughs> but if you come from a place of that works for you, ultimately yeah. it's your ship, yeah. you know, and your their ship is a reflection of you. You know, if you make, you'll make better choices. Yeah. And that's pretty much all building a startup is, is make consistently making choices and recorrecting and recorrecting and making new choices and recorrecting every day is a series of choices. And I think as far as character trait goes, um, you know, look, I'm fortunate enough. I've been in the Valley since the dot-com boom, right? So I've seen, I've been part of building stuff since then. And I'm very fortunate. I happen to know some of the name brand people and people consider name brand. I knew them when they weren't name brand. I've seen where they come and what, I've seen the, how the sausage is made. And, and you know what? There's a couple of things. One is uh, tenacity. Mm. You cannot, uh, tenacity is probably like the most, valuable trait you'll get in a founder. Mm -hmm. You know, like that's one of the reasons why when I speak with a, with a founder, I want to know why they're doing what they're doing. Is it because it's a hot space? Is it because they can make easy money? Is it because it's cool? Whatever. It's No, I want someone who was born to do this. Who's like been thinking about this problem since he was five. Yeah. You know, I don't care if it succeeds or not. I want to bet him every time he works on it. Right. Eventually he will hit it. He or she will hit it. Right. right? That tenacity actually comes from that. Because uh, you can be tenacious about the wrong things. So you want tenacity about what they're passionate about and they're building. Um, another one is, uh, you know, and this is actually, I find, an irrational belief in the validity of their thing, which comes, which is great. You want a founder, because if it was rational, someone else would have done it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, corporate America would have done it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we we often talk about um, the Princeton economist who's going to like the... Um, you know, king of behavioral psychology. And, you know, he talks about, um, it's not a rational exuberance. He talks about um, this, this, this innate confidence that you can, that you can do something that no one thinks you can do, right? That you almost need to be a little bit crazy in order to believe things that people don't. And in fact, you, without that, you can't accomplish the things that people don't think you can accomplish. So I think, um, I agree with you on that. Yeah, because I've met too many people saying, I have this idea, I just need a co-founder. I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. you know, like, right. no. Like, if you really cared, I, I've i met founders who were literally, I backed one, it's what, pretty what, one of the best investments from my fund ever. Yeah. The guy was living in a car for years, you know, like just working on this. And and when he was raising money, he was so smart about it. Right. And such a hard space. I just one out of 10 words that came out of his mouth. Yeah. And I was like, I don't understand what you're saying, but let me give you some money. <laughs> like, really, like, I want to back you. And literally, it turned out to be so far the best investment I've done in my career. Uh, yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know? <laughs> it, was, uh, it was Daniel Kahneman, and it's delusional optimism. Uh, That's what it is. Okay. So we'll go back and put the notes in for that. So well, I think what you're telling me, you know, to, as an answer to the question is that these, the right things must, in fact, co coexist, Right. The, the notion of uh, loving yourself and finding the crowd of people that that kind of works within that along with you know tenacity along with 
um, you know, kind of irrational uh, confidence associated with that. Like those things, in fact, can exist and should exist um, well, it within, the, within the character makeup of an individual. It depends. I know plenty of incredibly successful people who hate themselves, mm. <laughs> or who don't love themselves. How mm. many people do we know who actually truly love themselves, mm. right? Yeah. So I don't think it's required, no, but look, what kind of life do you want? And right. I bet you success is easier to be had. At least it's been for me yeah. and people I've known that when they made that shift, that yeah. kind of shift, internal shift, success is a natural byproduct and it's also more fulfilling. So it's a oh, sweeter success. Yeah. It's not only success, but it's a sweeter it's, it's, success. It's, it's fulfilling. And you know, there's something special about that, that sense of fulfillment. So I was going to ask you, all right, so I love myself. What do I get? But then I thought, that's a stupid question. I'm going to think- You get a car. I'm going to think, yeah, you get a Maserati. <laughs> get a Maserati. Get a Maserati. Yeah. Maserati. Um, I thought, all right, I'm going to put a little mental energy into this myself and okay. see if you agree. Okay. Um, so I think, as I touched on, I think self-respect is a thing that you get. Yes. I think forgiveness is a thing that you get. Um, I think confidence is a thing that results and exudes and I think the net result of that is, I don't go as far as to say karmic, but the world takes notice of that. Well, it really does. And, you know, you can go through some all the way to like as new age as you want to just as simple as we're, human, we're animals and we perceive in the other per, in each other way more than a conscious mind is saying. You know, like we perceive so many nuances and signals and interactions that that our subconscious takes in and subconscious is really what runs us, not the neocortex. The neocortex just makes up the reason for what the subconscious set, it made us do, right? So you could just be something like that. And when you come across that way around other people, things happen. Mm -hmm. It could be just that simple, right? You know, it could be just because of our animal selves all the way down to, but I think life is bigger than that. But that's my personal theory. Self-fulfilling prophecy. All right, so look, I always end with um, kind of the standard three questions, but my final specific question is um, is this. So, all right, it's been a number of years now. What have you come to understand about why this book resonates so well with people? Is it just a bunch of people that were, you know, had a hole in their life? Was it the honesty? Like, what, what have you learned now that great, you've had? That's a great question. Something I've been asking myself because I'm expanding it, right? Because right. I'm terrified of breaking it. <laughs> Oh, you know? it's great. That's a, yeah, <laughs> certainly. Um, I think it was, it was the sharing the truth. Yeah, just true, simple. Take myself out of it. This is what helps. Yeah, that simple. You know the cover. Um, I went with the cover. I took a big risk. It covers a picture of a guy with a gun to his head with a big red heart because mm -hmm. the heart saves. And mm -hmm. I took a big because it showed that that's closer to the truth of where I was than anything. And you know, so I took a risk with that too. And interesting enough, I've had many men reach out to me and say, you know, I bought that cut book because of that cover because I could tell that a man wrote in us some new agey, whatever. It came from like a guy, right? right? And which had surprised me. Like I didn't expect that. I didn't know what I was doing, honestly. I'm fortunate I didn't. I just tried to do the best, the most honest part of product, if you want to look at it that way, I could put out to the world and a distribution channel, which is Amazon, and the rest took care of, literally took care of itself. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a little, I mean, we, t we alluded to that very thing in the intro and there's a little double entendre in the title itself. So, I mean, I think yeah. that makes, that makes a ton of sense. Okay. Uh, final three questions, which means we're near the end. Um, one, something about this topic that I didn't touch on that you think is really important that we address. I just want to like give you the floor for a moment. If there's something like, Hey dude, you didn't ask me this and it's really key to the whole thing. Um, I can't thank you for anything. We're good. Yeah. Like, I mean, this is well, a really we're good. I'd say this is one of the best interviews I've ever had. Holy mackerel! I kid you not. Holy uh, cow! You've made me. You stumped me a few times too. You made me think, and I want to listen to this. I think I'll learn from this Sweet. one. All right, number two. Um, you're pretty easy to find, but why don't you just say where people can find you? Right. Um, I like Twitter. That's my favorite. Twitter, yeah. Yeah, it's at Kamal Ravikant. Um, I could spell it out for you. K-A-M-A-L-R-A-V-I-K-A-N-T. Um, yeah, Twitter, obviously on Amazon. Amazon. Done books. and done. Yeah. Done and done. And okay, so you you uh, talked about the other books that you've written mm -hmm. and you teased us on the new expanded version. Any other materials that you would recommend for people who are like, okay, I get it. I need a little bit more, I need a schedule, or I need a, like any other tools that you would recommend besides your book? 
I mean, look, there's books I love. Um, but this topic, I mean, I literally wrote the book I, I wish someone had given me. <laughs> you wrote the book on it. I mean, yeah. like, I looked for books, and I couldn't, like, I scanned it. And I, the answer and I didn't can find be no. I, no, this is it. I, I mean, I, have, I can give you session books and all sorts of other different things. But for this, literally, it was... It came from me, and it was the book I wish someone had given me. There we go. I'm gonna stay I mean, very epically <laughs> focused. I'm not, I'm not gonna expand. I don't need. I don't need. To. I don't know how selfish that sounds, but it's being honest. <sighs> Look, if that's what you got, that's what you got. Um, right. Okay, Kamal, uh, let's end our discussion right here. I want to thank you very much for. I, I think it's a vital dialogue, right? It, on a topic, it's unique topic. It's important. Uh, I don't know if we've really, like you mentioned just a second ago, we haven't really had a framework to talk about this type of thing before certainly we've been talked about on the pod i agree with you i think it's a great conversation um and by the way being face to face has been fantastic so it has thank you very much thank you for having me this has been intangibles as always i'd like to thank denton's venture technology group at denton's venturebeyond.com for being the sponsor this season and a supportive partner operating as a boutique within the world's largest law firm the Venture Technology Group runs with hard-charging tech entrepreneurs to drive growth through strategic business, finance, and legal advice from Silicon Valley and New York to London, Berlin, Hong Kong, and beyond. Learn more at DentonsVentureBeyond.com. I'd also like to thank Ben Glowey, our sound engineer. If you'd like to work with him, he can be reached via Twitter. His handle is at Venture underscore sound. And thank you. Keep an eye out for the next episode. I'm your host, Steve Berg.